the topic of my talk today is essentially to look at what were the consequences of the Voluyev circular. But the problem with that is that there is almost no way for us to quantify, for us to actually trace the consequences of either Voluyev or M's. It, I, I make, in the longer version of the paper, a, a longer argument for this. But in the simplest of terms, how do you measure acceleration in a predictable way? That is, what would have happened had there not been a Voluyev circular? And that's practically impossible to determine. So the next best thing that we can do is to look at individuals and trace their careers as exemplars of what the Voluyev circular and later the end Lukas did. And in that respect, I want to focus on Ivan Nechui Levitsky, who is in some measure the, the primary example, the primary victim of the Voluyev circular and the end Lukas. On July 1863, when Minister Voluyev signed the secret instructions to the censorship committees of Kiev, Moscow, and Petersburg, Ivan Nechui Levitsky was a 24-year-old student at the Cave Theological Academy, from which he would graduate with a master's degree in theology in the spring of 65. The students in this conservative religious academy, like young intellectuals throughout Rus the Russian Empire, were to some degree under the influence of new liberal and sometimes even radical ideas. No doubt they were involved in various activities that could be deemed subversive by the authorities. For example, in 1861, the year that Nechui arrived at the school, Paolo Zhitetsky, the future compiler of a Ukrainian dictionary, was dismissed from the Kiev Theological Academy for his involvement with a group of academy students who, influenced by the ideas of Charles Fourier, produced a written expose of the corrupt practices at the school, which was published in Hedson's Kolokol. No doubt there were, was also some enthusiasm for Ukrainian culture and literature among the students of the academy. This is, in particular, the thesis of Sergei Yefremov, who, like Nechui, was a priest's son and a product of the same religious school. Yefremov sees the entire Ukraine file movement of the 1860s and 70s as the personal struggle of devoted martyrs living in a world divided between their private instinctive, deterministic commitment to the Ukrainian cause, and hostile public day-to-day -day world of imperial reality, where they transformed themselves like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde into different beings. Yefremov's speculation that the Academy provided some stimulus for Nechui's ideas on Ukrainian culture is partially borne out by Nechui's own words about his novel Khmare, which is self-evidently a product of his experiences at the school. The testimony of Nechui's works, letters, memoirs, and the speculations in Yefremov's biography, common sense, deductions based on his biography, they all point to the importance of Nechui's experiences at the Theological Academy in formulating his lifelong devotion to the cause of Ukrainian culture and literature. However, this devotion was formulated in private without any external markers of his inclinations or evidence of his participation in activities or groups that would help confirm or explain his thinking. The administration of the old-fashioned religious school was at odds with the sentiment of those of its students who felt inclined to use their education for the benefit of Ukrainian peasants. Such was the young Radyuk, whom Nechui depicts in Khmare. The degree to which this fictional character actually reflected the qualities of Nechui's academy friends on whom he was modeled is not clear. In later years, Nechui was criticized for the feeble energy and political confusion of Radyuk's activism. These traits, traits might have been the actual qualities of the student activists, but they're probably also evidence that the writer, Nechui, was not personally involved in these rebellious activities. Had he been politically active, he likely would not have earned commendations from the academy's principal and faculty for his good grades, but also for his exemplary good behavior and modesty. The Voluyev Circular specifically focused on the use of the Ukrainian language and its role as a tool in educating the general population. The Russian professors and students who set the tone at the academy were generally hostile to the idea of education or literature in Ukrainian, according to Nechui. 
He quotes one professor as telling the students that in the interest of the state, it would be best to burn all Ukrainian literature. Naturally, in such an environment, it would not have been prudent for a career-minded student to advertise the fact that he aspired to become a Ukrainian writer. Judging by his surviving epistolary and memoiristic works, Nitri was likely a very private man. He reveals very little of himself in any of his writing. There are very few personal recollections of him, and those that exist are mostly from his later years in Cave. We know very little of his relations with his parents and sibling. There is no record of close friends. The bulk of his correspondence concerns practical matters, most often in relation to the publication of his works. Aside from his belletristic writing, Nitri did not leave a large footprint in the world. Personal reticence was surely a feature of his personality. But had he been a man with something to hide, a criminal avoiding detection by the authorities, his way of life might have been the same. <coughs> in his characteristic personal reticence, as in so many other qualities of his life and personality, Nitrui embodies and exemplifies the impact of the Imperial Russian government's war against Ukrainian cultural identity in the late 19th century. Whether through direct cause, ancillary consequence, or accidental convergence, his life story, his personality, and his public activity all seem to be a reflection of the specific policies adopted by the Tsarist government to restrict the growth of Ukrainian culture. For better or worse, the impact of the Vluyev circular and later the Andrukas can be gauged quantitatively, psychologically, aesthetically, and symbolically on his person. The Vluyev circular and its specific directives banned the publication of books in Ukrainian with the exception of those that belong to the realm of fine literature. In principle then, Inasmuch as he was destined to be primarily a writer of fine literature, Nitri might have remained unaffected by this decree. But that was not the case. Valuyev's instructions identified the Ukrainian language with subversion, thus branding it a marker of political dissent and protest in Russia. In effect, it turned an otherwise conservative and loyal citizen like Nitri into something approaching a criminal. What's more, the text of the circular clearly identified education, specifically the education of the masses, as a problematic issue inextricably tied to the same politically dangerous ideas as the use of the Ukrainian language. So Nitrui was doubly damned, first as a promoter of the Ukrainian language, and then as an educator. Finally, the minister also saw fit to mention the Ukrainian translation of the New Testament, recently submitted to the censors for approval, as another undesirable manifestation of this politically suspect interest in the Ukrainian language. Although not a particularly religious man, Nitri was the product of a clergy family and was completing an entirely religious course of education. That too was seen in less than benevolent terms if combined with Ukrainian sentiment. Despite all these foreboding indicators, Nitri was ready to make his way in the world. He hoped for an appointment as a teacher in Kiev, but was given an assignment at the seminary in Poltava. He was well liked by his students, and one memoirist recalls his emotional readings of Shochenko in class. But the salary earned by teachers in Orthodox seminaries was very small, and Nitri realized that if he stayed, he would be condemned to terrible poverty. There was another factor as well. In Poltava, Nechui began to write. There he wrote his first works entitled Dvi Moskoke. In the aftermath of the Valuyev circular, this was an activity that could, be com that could not be comfortably pursued within the bounds of an orthodox religious institution. Nechui needed a position that paid better and offered more personal freedom. Ironically, the opportunity arose as a result of the same Polish uprising that also led to the Valuyev circular. Russian imperial authorities took a number of repressive steps following the uprising to prevent a recurrence. One step was to inculcate loyalty to the empire by better controlling the education of Polish children. Of course, teachers in these outlying and potentially hostile provinces, from a Russian perspective, would be paid better, a kind of combat pay, and they would moreover earn one and a third years of service for every year actually served, which is why Nitri Levitsky was able to go out on a pension so early. But not all the children living in what was considered Polish territory were Poles. 
many were Ukrainians. So here was an opportunity for Ukrainian teachers to exploit the Russificatory policy to their own advantage. Nechui asked two of his former academy professors, Teofan Lebedinsev, the historian and future editor of the journal Kievskaya Starina, who was serving as the supervisor of the Holm School District, and Yevhen Krzynowski, who was also taking up a position as a supervisor of the school district administration in Podlasia, to find him a position in the town of Bila, Gala Podlaska, 147 kilometers east of Warsaw, in an area with a significant Ukrainian population. <coughs> Lebedinsev did manage to place Serhii Hrushevsky, the father of the future historian, Mikhailo Hrushevsky, in the home schools. But Nechui did not get the position he wanted and was appointed to a girls' high school in Kalish, 207 kilometers west of Warsaw. This was not even remotely a Ukrainian area, and Nechui found himself in the heart of Poland teaching Polish girls Russian language. Not surprisingly, he asked to be transferred, and in June 67, after just one year in Kalish, he took up a similar position at a girls' high school in Siedlce, 89 kilometers east of Warsaw. This was a girls' school for uniates, that is, for Ukrainian girls. Nechui felt more comfortable here and participated in activities with his students that went beyond his formal duties as a Russian teacher. He even accepted the position of school librarian, which entailed a small salary bonus. Where the salary for a seminary teacher in Poltava had been, according to Nechui himself, 250 rubles, in Selce, he was reportedly earning 1,200. As with much of Nechui's biography, there is no shortage of ironies and uncertainties in this episode. On the face of it, Nechui was the beneficiary, in a financial sense at least, of the repressive policies of the imperial government. Not only was he to be paid much better than he would have been paid in Poltava and qualify sooner for a pension, which he would collect for a very long time after his retirement, but he would be teaching Ukrainians. His subject was Russian language and literature, of course, but we know that his extracurricular activities in the school included participation in the staging of Kudlerowski's Natalka Poltavka. In keeping with Nechui's general reticence, we have only the scantest evidence for precisely why he wanted to leave Poltava. Money was certainly a strong motive, but in his memoirs he also says, I knew that I could not hold on at a theological seminary if I would be writing in Ukrainian. Was there a real threat, or was Nechui merely reacting to a general sense of the conservative nature of religious institution? Had the Valuyev of Circular succeeded in evoking fear, even though the specific writing that Nechui was pursuing was explicitly permitted, since it was Belev? Was the Valuyev of Circular pushing Nechui into the ethnically mixed, partially Ukrainian territories of eastern Poland? Nechui said the period also so illustrates another irony, perhaps the most important one of the Voluyev Circular and the Emzukas. Among the officials involved in ratifying the plans that Lebedinsev and Krzyzanowski were formulating for the schools in the Union Eparchies were former members of the Kirillo Methodian societies, Vasil Bilozerski and Pantelimon Kulish, who had been rehabilitated and were now officials on imperial service in Warsaw. After Nechui transferred to Sedlce, he established contact with Kulish and showed him the stories he had written in Poltava and Kalish. At this time, Kulish was actively promoting contacts with Ukrainians in Austria, and he was specifically involved with the establishment of Ukrainian journal in view called Prauda, which became the mainstay of Ukrainian publishing for most of the last third of the 19th century. Kulish sent Nechui's works to the journal for publication and encouraged the young author to produce even more including works specifically targeted at Ukrainians in Austria, such as Ukrainian translations of Russian writers, which made sense in view, but would have seemed a waste of time in Kiev. Eventually, Nechui established his own direct links with Prauda and with Ukrainian activists in Lviv and, and published most of his major works in that periodical. The connection between Prauda and Nechui was one of the turning points in the history of Ukrainian literature and culture, not only symbolically, but in a real and practical way as well. Ukrainian literature in Russia would likely not have survived in the era of re imperial repression if it had not been possible to publish in Western Ukraine. Would anyone in the Russian Empire still be interested in writing in Ukrainian in 1899 
if there had been no opportunity to circumvent the repressive edicts by publishing in Austria, if there had been no Ukrainian literature to read for 25 years, if there had been no Ukrainian writers setting a good or a bad example for their fellow writers to emulate or disparage, if there had been no Nechui in print, the connection between between Prauda and Nechui, and generally between Ukrainian intellectuals in Austria and those in Russia, also created the common cultural space that allowed these two oppressed minorities to recognize each other as members of the same nation. In a delicious irony that cannot help but delight patriotic Ukrainians, the Valuya Circular and the Emzukas, to the degree that they were responsible for re-establishing this East-West connection, not only failed in their general purpose, but actually helped develop a separate Ukrainian cultural identity, helped establish it. The <coughs> unintended consequences of bad policy can be very surprising indeed. The existence of this East-West connection, however, was merely an opportunity. The pipeline needed to be filled. This meant that someone needed to provide literary works for publication, financing for the journals in view, and operational support and planning. What was needed was an organization. As we have seen, the truly established contacts with Western Ukrainians through Pantelemon Kulish. But Kulish himself was something of an outsider in the Ukrainian intellectual community at this time. After the demise of Osnova, his organizational role in Ukrainian cultural affairs was in decline. Nechui needed a link to the activists in Kyiv, who, following the setbacks of the Valuyev Circular, were reinventing themselves as a semi-secret organization that would come to be known as the Hromada. Once again, between Nechui's personal reticence and the secrecy now required to conduct Ukrainophile activities in Kyiv, there is almost no evidence indicating how Nechui established contact with and eventually joined the Hromada. His publications were certainly attracting attention. His name appears in the correspondence of some key individuals, including Mikhailo Drahomanov, who mentions in November 71 that he had heard of Nechui a long time before from Kulish. Of course, as a teacher in Sedlice, Nechui was far removed from the activists who were forming the Hromada in Kyiv. It is well established, however, that he liked to go home to his native Stebliu and Bohuslav during holidays and visited Odessa during the summers of 71, 72, and 73. Whatever the destination, home, vacation, or both, many of these travels might readily have included or accommodated a stopover in Kyiv. The itinerary he describes in the first paragraph of his later work, Zhutsem Pochovani, is precisely such a trip from Selsa to Kyiv to his native region. One of the few Ukrainian writers actively publishing works of literature must have been a very welcome acquaintance for the expanding circle of Ukrainian activists in Kyiv. No doubt, Nechui reciprocated the interest. Whatever the paths traversed between Nechui and the Kyiv Ukrainophiles, the links were getting stronger. He was in Kyiv again in the summer of 73. And when the members of the Kyiv Hromada assembled for a group photograph during the archaeographic conference that they organized, a very young-looking Nechui, he was then 35, is among them, seated quite prominently near the center of the picture. On September 11, 74, Nechui is formally admitted as a member of the Kyiv Hromada. Since he was not a resident of Kyiv, he cannot have been a very active participant in their ongoing activities. But his membership put him in touch with a very influential group of Ukrainian cultural figures who were involved in a clandestine organization. Once again, the Valuyev Circular has an unexpected historical and personal impact. Without the repressive measures and the hostile environment they engendered, the Ukrainophiles could have developed their activities in the open without need for secrecy in clandestine organizations. Nechui and most other members of the old Hermada were cultural rather than political activists. They saw themselves as the defenders of noble human principles, as promoters of culture and education, not as revolutionaries battling the government for social change. But the Valuyev Circular and the atmosphere of suspicion and repression that accompanied it turned these ordinary intellectuals into lawbreakers. The criminalization of Ukrainophile activities would eventually push the Kyiv Hromada into explicitly political activity, a development so antithetical, antithetical to some of the older members, like Nechui, that it led to splits and disagreements <coughs> between 
the older and the younger members of the organization. But even the conservative old guard in the Hromada had been pushed by the repressive policies into an understanding of their own activities that included the necessity to put themselves beyond the law. Coercion had curtailed the development of Ukrainian culture for a time, but it had also emboldened previously timid activists. Through repression, cultural patriots were being turned into fanatics, and believers were being turned into jihadists. To the mix of emotions that guided Ukrainian, that guided Ukrainian files like Nechui, a new one had been added, anger. Let's jump forward to 76 and the Mzukaz, which went a step further than the Beluyev Circular and effectively prohibited any publication in Ukraine. Naturally, Nechui took this personally. His entire life's purpose was being cast into oblivion. He wrote an essay entitled Nepotrybnich Velikoruskui Literatury dla Ukrainy i dla Slavianszczyny. A long-winded and complex treaty about the nature of literature and its relation to a national culture. Here, Nechui argued that Russian culture and Ukrainian culture are different, and the only literature that is appropriate for Ukrainians is Ukrainian literature. He had said much more than that, but that argument alone captures the essence of the piece. A Ukrainian culture completely independent of Russian culture? For many, the idea was simply unthinkable. The Soviet Ukrainian scholar Alexander Bilecki expressed an accurate judgment of the importance of this essay. He didn't excuse or accept the ideas in the Trui's essay, but he understood their emotional origins. It's not a product of critical thinking, says Bilecki, but a product of emotion deeply scarred by the harsh measures of Tsarism, boiling over from the insult. <coughs> it was a shriek from the prison of nations. On this point, Bilecki hit the mark. The essay was indeed the shriek of a badly injured soul, an angry, vengeful tirade from His Holiness Nechui, the self-appointed keeper of the flame of Ukrainian cultural identity. This too was a major consequence of Valuyev and Ems, the irrational anger that these measures provoked among some of their victims, particularly Nechui. Furthermore, this anger itself is part of a larger and more pernicious consequence of the prohibitions, the absence of a public discourse. In the secretive, criminalized world of Ukrainian cultural activity in the Russian Empire in the last third of the 19th century, the most glaring absence, the most damaging blight, is the private nature of cultural activity. The Hromada is a powerful force, but their necessarily secretive nature prevents them from conducting direct communication with their audience, from soliciting and listening to feedback openly and, public, uh, openly and publicly expressed. Because of the repressive measures that limit their activity, they are reduced to a form of preaching to the converted. Of course, the members are sophisticated and intelligent social activists and have a reasonably good sense of public feelings, but the absence of the public discussion is itself a major obstacle. How can they influence people if they cannot communicate with them? The same circumstance holds doubly true for the belletristic literature, particularly prose. While many poets can write in private, as Shuchenko did, without much of an audience and sometimes without much hope of an audience, the same is not true for prose, particularly long prose. How many authors produce a second novel if their first is not published? How many potential authors will write a novel without an example to follow? How will a published author know how to improve his work and attract more readers if there is never any feedback from readers? How can a cultural paradigm undergo an evolutionary shift without an open discourse about culture? As aesthetic works of literary art, Nechui's novels and stories were particularly susceptible to the deleterious effects of the absence of public discourse. His writings show the signs of incomplete attention to his craft. The most glaring problem is with plot. Most of his works lack a clear sense of progressive development. Some of this is tied to his penchant for repetition, a stylistic feature that leads him into non-purposeful narrative modes and complicates plot development. But some of his stylistic and intellectual quirks might well have been smoothed out or polished into refinement if he had had more exposure to a literary discussion with readers, critics, and editors. Nechui's reputation as an anachronite is no doubt based, at least partially, on his actual behavior, reflecting his reclusive personality. But the repressive measures that forced him into secrecy and intellectual isolation were likely also a factor. 
The legends of Nechui's antisocial nature are largely the invention of a younger generation that no longer saw him as an effective spokesman for the Ukrainian cause. But the fact remains that Nechui had little opportunity for feedback from his readers. Likely, he would have been a better writer for such exchanges, building his skills in an atmosphere of professional stimulus, challenges, and competition. <coughs> this, too, was a legacy of the Voluyev and M's edicts, and it affected all the writers of his day, not just Nechui. The Voluyev circular and later the M's ukaz had a variety of more or less palpable influences on Nechui. As we have seen, they affected his choice of professional placements, his contacts with Western Ukraine, his involvement with the Hromada, and his hostility to Russian culture. They also stymied his professional development as a writer. Perhaps they even influenced his personality. Many turns of his personal life and literary career seem inextricably bound to the specific terms of the repress repressive edicts. In a final irony, as if to answer Valuyev's objection, to a translation of the Gospels, Nechui completed a Ukrainian translation of the Bible that had been undertaken by Pantelimon Kulish and left unfinished at his death. The Valuyev Circular and the Emzukaz played a major role in Nechui's life. This exploration of the impact of these measures on a single writer gives us a small but nuanced portion of the larger picture of the impact of these measures that quantitative data, even if it were available, would likely fail to illustrate completely. The impact of the Voluyev Circular led to the development of Ukrainian literature in a number of directions, some ironically toward greater geographic diversity and resilience in the face of adversity. As we have seen, a great deal more work needs to be done before the impact, the full impact can be understood. Both quantitative and biographical evidence is still lacking. The anniversary of the Voluyev Circular offers a useful opportunity to focus attention on the process through which Ukrainian literature, culture, and identity overcame the enormous hurdles that were deliberately put in their way. There is a great deal that needs to be done. Thank you.